Okay. <laughs> no, take it. So, okay, today, like as the title says, I'll talk about C0 symplectic geometry. So, just to introduce some notation. Uh, okay. So, do you hear me well? And I guess you see my screen. Okay. So, let's start with symplectic manifold. So, we all know it's a manifold equipped with the closed and non-degenerate closed and non-degenerate two form. And we'll mostly work with closed symplectic manifolds, even though some examples will be in R2N, but yeah, let's say it's closed. It means compact and no boundary. Okay, so we'll denote by simp. So the group of symplectic diffeomorphisms. So that's just diffeomorphism. Okay. Those are just diffeomorphisms which preserve symplectic form or symplectic structure. And as we all know, I guess, so we have like a natural subgroup, normal subgroup of simp. So we can put sim for diff, whatever. Group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, which are like uh, maps coming from Hamiltonian functions. So, which means there exists a Hamiltonian, which whose time one flow is fine. And as you probably know, so groups of symplectic diffeomorphism and HAM, they have a structure of infinite dimensional Lie groups, at least in symplectic case. And uh, so for Hamiltonian group, we can identify its Lie algebra with the space of autonomous Hamiltonians. And then uh, Lie bracket. And HAM, as you know, is given by, by Poisson bracket. So in the symplectic case, it's just defined like this. Okay, so these are like standard notions. And so what is so C0 symplectic geometry? So let's say that roughly it investigates in the, which phenomena persist or do not persist under C0 limits. And by C0, I mean any C0, let's, but mostly we'll deal with compact open topology. So when we say C0, we mean compact open topology. But since we work on compact manifolds, it's the same as all definitions are the same. So take any you like. Okay, so this is like um, subfield simplex geometry, and everything started with theorem of Eliasberg and Gromov. Maybe some of you know about it, which says that it states that group of symplectic diffeomorphisms is C0 closed subset of group of all diffeomorphisms. So I'm not aware whether the similar result holds in Poisson category, but okay. That's maybe an interesting question. And uh, okay, maybe another aspect of C0 symplectic geometry. So let me let me just say a few things. So why is this result so great? Because uh, as we see, so symplectic diffeomorphisms are 
it's a, it's a, like a statement above first derivatives. So we ask if we ask for something of, on full back of our map phi. And a priori, we, we cannot like say immediately that C0 limit, which doesn't say anything about the derivative, like preserve that, uh, that property. So this is why this theorem is so, so good. So this raised a lot of questions about, um, so for example, let me draw a parallel with, so for people who saw only the rank of homology, they might think that it's just something about smooth manifolds, but we know that in general, like we can construct homology and cohomology on like more general objects. So in this sense, we started like this whole field to, to see whether, whether symplectic geometry is really about smooth objects or we can, or we can like reduce the regularity of our objects and maybe some, maybe assign similar structures to some more general objects. And in this talk, since this is Poisson seminar, I wanted to mention maybe one result, which, <clears throat> which is about uh, Poisson structures, or Poisson bracket in this case. And this is the, this is theorem due to Cardan and Viterbo. It's also known as C0 rigidity of Poisson brackets. It says the following, so assume we have a sequence of smooth functions, hk and fk, which c0 converge to, again, smooth functions h and f, and such that their Poisson bracket, c0 converge to zero. Then, the same holds for h and f. So again, um, I mean, it's it's the same reasoning. For some bracket, it's something about uh, again first derivatives, and there is no reason so a priori to have any form of C zero rigidity. But uh, as we can see, so. It has some fun. So of course it's uh, it's too much to expect that that we have like full C0 rigidity. Like if you have two functions, uh, so if you have two functions which uh, commute to function h and f, then then their Poisson bracket also commute to the Poisson bracket of the limits. So this is the so maybe an example of that a remark. Two remarks about this result. So. Okay, so C0, so Poisson brackets do not converge do not C0 converge in general. So it's just something about commutativity. So maybe an example is we'll look at R2 with standard symplectic form and sequences of functions. So f of p of p is f of p square root of n cosine n. So maybe not fk, but fn. And hk of p of p to the f of p square root of n and then just sign and q. And then one can check that uh, was some bracket where f is any smooth function on r. Then one can check that uh, a bracket of h k f k. And so I did the computation itself. P f prime of p, maybe with the minus sign. So, but it's something of this sort. While, but then in the other, on the other hand, f k, and h a uniformly converges to zero. So we see that this, that this assumption that uh, for some brackets also converge to zero is, uh, is important. In general, the theorem does not hold. Okay, so what else can we say about theorem of 
the Terbe Cadenso, then as you probably as you maybe read in the abstract, so it can be more general. It's it, we can prove in stronger statement, which is due to so we can prove stronger statement. So that's due to Antov and Polterovich. which says that uh, yeah, no, I'm mixing them. That this functional, which uh, for every pair of functions assigned, like it's C0 norm of its Poisson bracket, this is lower semi-continuous. With respect to C zero topology. So that that just means that the limit of H K F K converging to H F In the discord. Okay, so please ask questions if you have any questions. So, so we can see that this is like more general because if HK and FK converge to zero, then also we can get the commutativity of H and F. But in general, we just know something about limiting. And maybe also, so how we can, so this theorem of and then if the turbo allows us to define so commutative to, to say when two not necessarily smooth functions, may, let's say just continuous functions, when they are commutative. So so Cardan Viterbo theorem allows us to define commutativity of Continuous functions, let's say. Functions. So let's say that H and F are just continuous functions on M. So then we say that H and F, let's say Cardan Viterbo commute. If and only if there exist sequences of smooth functions on M, which C0 converge. To H and F, and whose Poisson bracket converges to zero. And by cardan viterbo theorem, so this commutativity like uh, coincides with the standard notion of commutativity for smooth functions. And for example, one can prove so if you have H and C one or C infinity, okay, so we just need a flow. And F being just continuous function, so such that H and F are then with turbo commute. So then we can show that uh, F is constant along the flow. Of H. So in this, as you can see, so, so you can imagine this. This can have some uh, applications in dynamics, and it actually has. So, Caesar and symplectic geometry has many applications in dynamics. Okay, so are there any questions so far? Um, may I? Sure. Uh, yeah, I was about to write it in the chat, but uh, since you're asking, uh, uh, can you give an, an example of a pair of uh, non smooth emuting functions? Like that. Uh -huh. So, yes, I think so. Uh, let me try. Maybe I'll. So, if you take H and F, which smooth functions, which commute, 
And then you take the sequence of symplectomorphisms, which C0 converge to some homeomorphism phi. Okay, so then you can show that H composite psi and F composite are then with turbo commute. And this is just for my mind. Well, but then uh, you, I guess one would need an example of such a sequence. Uh, yes, so, so I think in, in R2, it's, it should not be that hard to construct. You take some rotations around uh, the origin and ask for it to, to rotate uh, maybe faster and faster. So, so I don't, yeah, I cannot, uh, I cannot write an example on the spot, but uh, there are examples of such things. So maybe a reference would be uh, Owen Mueller's paper. Maybe also you, you can look at Cardan Viterbo's paper where they prove this result. But I don't know at, at, at the spot. But it's, it's, we are not talking about empty sets. So. OK, thank you. Any other questions? So there is a yeah. question. Yeah, hold just I was saying, just asking the chat. Uh, sh should I read it or I don't know if you have the chat there? Yes. yes. Uh, so the question is whether the, so if, it, if the function is constant along the flow, whether it is, does it commute with the, in this sense? Uh, f, f, f. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know in the spot. I, uh, I cannot say anything. Sorry. Okay. So. It's okay. So let me. Okay. Focus. Uh, on maybe a sun open problem in. Maybe the central open problem in. Uh, C0 symplectic geometry. So for that, so let me recall the theorem of Eliasberg and Gromov, it says that symplectic diffeomorphisms are C0 closed in group of diffeomorphisms. And so one can also define, so in this following, so in the same sense as we define like commutativity of C0 functions, we can define like uh, symplectic homeomorphisms by using theorem of Eliasberg and Gromov. And those are, maybe the central object in C0 symplectic geometry. So we say that uh, uh, phi, or let's say eta, is a symplectic homeomorphisms, homeomorphism. If that is a C0 limit of C0 limit of symplectic homeomorphism. So if, you, if it lies in C0 closure group simp inside the group of all homeomorphisms. Okay, so now when we have a, a definition of symplectic homeomorphism, then we can also like generalize notion of symplectic manifold or like non-smooth objects and define uh, C0 symplectic manifolds or topological symplectic manifolds. Is a manifold, is a topological manifold whose transition functions are symplectic 
Oh, mi amor. And okay, it's obvious that any smooth manifold admits a C0 symplectic structure, but so far it, that's an open question. Uh, question, open problem. So are there any manifolds which admit C0 symplectic structure? But not a smooth simplex. Uh, actually, the first example that we could think of is uh, R spheres and the managing in. Yeah, indeed, I was going to say, is it only me or <laughs> I wasn't there, so the other people are moving, so. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure we can send him a message. Just yeah, he just texted me that something ah, okay. got wrong. So, yeah. okay, um, let's wait and see. Yeah, because one, he's here with- his devices is online, right? Ex exactly, yeah, he's here uh, with the other, uh, with the tablet, so. I think it was only in the in the one where he was talking and speaking. Yeah, right. Recording no security chat. Uh, how can I? I think this is the one from Alvaro. The uh -huh, so uh, meeting. Yeah, uh, no, I cannot find. Sorry for this, but uh, I cannot find like how to share screen. No, don't worry. More erase hand security okay. meeting settings. Disconnect audio. So I'm not sure what. No, no, no. Share content here. It is. Okay. Great. Okay. So did you hear everything? Uh, I, I think it, we, we, it was really when you, you were writing down this question and then I think you so probably you said something else after and that maybe we lost. But, uh, okay. So I said that it's a big open question in the field whether there are like topological manifold which has C0 symplectic structure but not the smooth structure. And in particular, so like the most natural examples of smooth manifolds, which do not admit symplectic structures are spheres. So it's natural to ask whether spheres admit C0 symplectic structure. And uh, this is currently a work in progress of mine. Uh, so that if we ask the same question, so the answer is no. If we look at Lipschitz manifolds instead of topological manifolds. So I claim that the uh, spheres do not admit Lipschitz symplectic structure, which I will, if time is, because this is still work in progress, I still haven't figured out all the details, but uh, I didn't know whether this was supposed to be a research talk or just survey talk. So maybe if time, if, if I have enough time, I'll discuss this, uh, how to prove this theorem. And let me just say that Lipschitz manifolds are just uh, manifold, topological manifolds, which admit, uh, which has an atlas whose transition functions are Lipschitz homeomorphisms, which means that their Lipsch, their homeomorphisms homeomorphisms, which are Lipschitz, and their inverse is also Lipschitz. Okay, and so why is this uh, 
good because you can say, okay, Lipschitz functions are almost the same as smooth functions, and that is true. But Lipschitz manifolds are much closer to topological manifolds than to smooth manifolds by result due to Sullivan, which says that every topological manifold admits a unique Lipschitz structure. So it has a subatlas uh, which consists of Lipschitz homeomorphisms. Which is of course not true that every topological manifold is mutable. So, so Lipschitz category is much closer to topological category than to smooth category. Okay, so what was what is the plan for the rest of the talk? So the plan is to first to prove Elias Bergromov's theorem using result of Cardan Viterbo, then maybe to prove Cardan Viterbo theorem. And then in the end, if I get in, if there is still time left, then I can discuss theorem star. Okay, so maybe I give you a minute to think about questions while I try to log in my computer. So yeah, are there any questions? Can you hear me? That's also a question. Yes. No, okay. I was just going to mention maybe before, because I didn't stop you because I was not sure if uh, Dima wrote like, uh, I think when you were discussing about uh, the counter example or something, I suppose that, uh, I mean, you can read it if the X uh, commutes with uh, X squared minus one. The absolute no. Thanks. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. You're there, Tushin? Okay, I'm there. I will not join with the audio. Just okay. Uh -huh. So in chat, uh, yeah, so it's some example, but uh, okay, now I cannot see the chat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but okay. We can discuss later after that. Okay, so. I'll ask the question. Can you see the sure. chat? Uh, can I ask it out loud then? Yeah, feel free. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, does the absolute value of x commute with uh, uh, the absolute value of x squared minus one on R two? Well, I don't know on the spot that, to be honest. I mean, I, I would have to write it down. Do you have any reason why it would? Uh, uh, I, I don't have any reason why it would not. I'm just trying to understand like what's what's going on. Uh, so I, it's useful to have some simple example. Well, you, you would have to approximate so absolute, absolute value of x and absolute value of x squared minus one with smooth functions. Yeah, and I, I suppose with, you can do that by, I don't know, uh, Fourier series or something. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, I, I expect the answer to be yes. I'm just uh, trying to, you yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, if you, uh, you, you can probably, I, I don't know on the spot. I mean, to be honest, I, I have to write it down the same as you, so. Okay, no problem. Okay, so now proof of the Ashby grammar. Yeah. And okay, so for the proof of Elias Bergamo term, we'll use the following lemma, which I will not prove here, but uh, you can do it at home. So F, let's F be a diffeomorphism, which preserves Poisson commutativity. Is, and then we say that that's equivalent statement as saying that F is conformal symplectic map for some C in R. So I will not prove this, I'm leaving that to you. And okay, so for now, how the proof goes. So we take, so you remember, we want to prove that the uh, group of symplectic diffeomorphisms is uh, C0 closed in group of all diffeomorphisms. So let's say that we have a sequence of symplectomorphisms which C0 converge to 
some phi, which is just diffeomorphism in general. Uh, okay, so then we take any two Hamiltonians, which was on commute, just commute. Which can be, so the, then what we have, so that means that H and F is zero. So then we look at the sequence HK given by pullback by phi K of H and FK, which is phi K pullback of F. So then in C zero, this converge to F composed phi pullback by F and this could C zero converge to phi pullback of H. And then we want to apply the lemma we just stated. So what is Poisson bracket of HK and FK? It's phi K pullback H, phi K pullback F. And since FKs are simple automorphisms, this is just HF composed with phi K. And this is zero, so it C zero converges to zero. So we now can apply Cardan with Herbert here. So then by Cardan with Herbert, we have that also like phi pullback H, phi pullback F is zero. So we show that phi preserve was some commutativity. So by previous lemma, we know that phi pullback omega is C omega for some real number. But then we have, so we look at classes of symplectic form. And so we know that symplectic form defines a class in a second DRAM group of M. So then phi K, class of phi K omega is the same as class of omega because phi K is symplectomorphism. And then we have that phi pullback omega is by what we just proved is C times the class of omega. But since phi k c0 converges to phi, so for k big enough, these two will be homotopic, and then these two are the same. They induce the same map in the Ramco homology, so these are the same. And so from this, we conclude that c is equal to 1. And that phi is indeed a simple homomorphism. Any question? Was it too quick? Or... No, okay. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to do is proof of Cardan with Turbo theorem. And for that, I'm going to use the notion of Hofer metric. So we need, actually, I don't know if we need, but we'll use. So what is Hofer metric? So first, for any Hamiltonian, on M, we define a norm, the other norm, uh, as such. So max HT minus max min DT. And then naturally we can extend this uh, notion to, so for phi and ham. We define phi as infimum of all over all h's that generate phi of this notion. And this is a, uh, it turns out that this, uh, this theorem, I think it's proven by Lalonde de Macduff. That this is actually a, B invariant non 
invariant norm. So let me just add non degenerate because that, that, that's really the hard part here to prove. It uses homomorphic curves. And uh, so it's really non trivial to prove that this is non degenerate and that it actually induces a norm. <clears throat> okay, so let me prove. Because then we throw it here. So what we want to show, so let me recall the statement. So we have HK C0 converging to H, FK C0 converging to F, and such that their Poisson bracket also converges to zero. And okay, so denote the flow of HK by FKT, the flow of FK, okay, not F, maybe H is better. By FKS, just to distinguish the parameters, and the flow of H by HT, flow of F by FS. So, to show that H and F commute, we'll show that their flows commute. And for that, we will use the notion of Hoffer metric. So first consider the following flow given by HT, HKS, this is just HKT, FKS, HK minus T, FK minus S. So consider this flow. And then you can show that it's uh, generated by the following Hamiltonian. So HK minus HK composed with FK minus S H minus T. And we want to show that this, uh, that this Flow commutes, Hoffer commutes to zero. And that will show by, uh, by showing that this uh, Hamiltonian is actually C0 small, because if we show that this Hamiltonian is C0 small, then from this definition, we'll immediately get that phi is, uh, that phi converges to identity in Hoffer norm. Okay, so how do we do this? So we, we just write this as uh, integral d over ds. So that denote this by, let's say, JK. And what do we get? So, okay, the first term does not depend on S. So we get uh, minus, you know, from zero to S. Then we get Poisson bracket of HK, FK composed. But we also get the minus because of this minus S up this minus S. So in the end, it's plus composite K H minus T DS. Okay, and this is less equal. So absolute value of this is less equal than S times absolute value of this term of the integrand. And by assumption, this tends to zero. So we showed that HK, T, F, K, S converges in Hoffer metric to identity for every S and zero. But since we have that HK, C zero converges to H, we have then that the flow of that the flow of HK Hoffer converges to flow of H, and the same conclusion for flow of FK and F. So then we also have that this in Hoffer metric. So this you can show using bi-invariance and triangle inequality for the norm that this converges to HT FK and uh, no, okay, just FS in Hoffer metric. And since, since this is actually a metric, so it's non-degenerate, 
So we can conclude that HDFS is actually an entity. So we proved that flows of these two things commute, which means that H and M commute. Maybe I should. So are there any questions? Maybe it was too quick or? So maybe right, uh, this is because HKT Hofer converges to HT and FKS Hofer converge to F. Is it okay, everyone? Okay. okay. So, okay, so we proved these two theorems. It was much quicker than I thought. But okay, so let's discuss uh, theorem star. So let me scroll back to the theorem. So we want to answer a question by Hofer. Okay, that's too ambitious. Like um, this problem so far is out of reach. I mean, for as you can see, almost 30 years. And uh, so as a reasonable step, okay, if we cannot, uh, prove something for topological manifold, maybe we can do something in between. And so what is in between? There are Holder manifolds and Lipschitz manifolds. And uh, okay, so theorem star says that if you ask uh, for like for slightly more for the structure of Lipschitz manifold, then uh, it does not admit C0 symplectic structure or Lipschitz symplectic structure, which I will explain now how to define. So what's the idea of the proof? The other proof is uh, exploit the fact that we have well-defined the RAM complex on Lipschitz manifolds. So, how we can do that? So let's let's first consider case Rn. So how we do define that? So we introduce some notion, introduce a notion of L infinity form. So we say that form, let's say omega, which has a ai run, ai k, then the hi wedge d h i k where a i i k's are l infinity functions on r n we say that this is so this is the definition this is l infinity k form on r n so we we do not ask for for this function to be smooth but just to be l infinity and we want to consider uh, the run complex out of this form. So we need a derivative. So how this is all, so let me just say that this is all known for like 50 years. It's uh, due to Whitney. It's written in one of his books. Uh, so how we, we define derivative like as we do in PD. So we say that uh, omega admits or has Omega has an exterior derivative d omega. If there exists a unique, if there exists a form d omega such that d omega which let's let's use alpha is omega which d alpha. Okay, then there we need minus one to a degree of omega, I think. For every alpha compactly supported smooth form of corresponding degree on Rn. 
So like, so we define basically weak exterior derivative <clears throat> for such forms. And okay, if then we define complex, so we say that omega is a flat form. If omega is L infinity form, and if its derivative is also an L infinity form. And then we consider, so one can check, it's not hard to check that d squared is zero. And then by, this is a theorem by Whitney. The cohomology of this complex, so, so let's define these forms by flat, let's say. The complex of flat force with this derivative is isomorphic to like the standard homology coefficients in R. Uh, <laughs> this is so far a statement for Rn. So it's basically yes. saying all of them are zero except the zero. Yes. But this is just a local model. So I, I want to explain how we can now transfer this to, to Lipschitz manifolds. This is just a story. So we'll do this in charts. So in, so we can say for every open set of R2 of Rn, not Rn. Let's say U is open set of Rn. And then we do everything on U. Okay. So th this will just serve us as a local model for. And so what's uh, an important thing that we're going to use for about Lipschitz maps is that F is, let's say, uh, between two open sets in R2N, Lipschitz. Then one can show that it's weakly differentiable. Differentiable and all of its, all partial derivatives are L infinite. So some people also call this rather Macher's theorem. Actually, we know that Lipschitz maps are almost ever differentiable and that derivative coincides with weakly derivative. It, yeah, with weak derivative and one can show that partial derivatives are actually of class L infinity. Okay, so that allows us to actually define a pullback by B Lipschitz map, let's say for a moment, Lipschitz of L infinity forms, just as, so we write AI composed with F and then the F I, because this is now well-defined by this theorem. And this is again in L infinity. So this is well-defined object. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, giving all the details here, so, but this is morally the idea. And so, and another theorem, which is also proven in Witness book, is that such defined pullback commute with weak derivative. And these two things actually allows us to, to translate everything to Lipschitz manifolds. So what is, just a definition, what is a L infinity form, if you want, on Lipschitz manifold? Manifold M. So it's, so we define it as a, so we take, we take Lipschitz atlas of, so Lipschitz manifold is a, okay, what, second countable locally compact house of space equipped with, a maximal atlas, uh, let's say phi A, such that phi A are the Lipschitz homomorphisms. And so we define differential form on a Lipschitz manifold to be like just a collection of forms in charts, which satisfy additional requirement that uh, omega A pull back. So now transition function is omega A inverse composed with omega B is omega b for every a and b in a.
and then they by this by witness theorem they have also well defined derivatives if they exist and then we can repeat the same procedure so define flat forms and define such a complex like here and the same conclusion holds that then we get that that cohomology defined in this way of this flat complex with derivative is isomorphic to the RAM cohomology of R. Not the RAM, but okay, yes, the RAM too, but of singular homology with R coefficients. And then what is the proof of the theorem? Theorem star. And we also have a form of Poincare duality given by integration. So just repeat, repeat the proof as in the smooth case. So we show that actually omega is a non-zero class in such defined DRAM complex of M. And also all, it, all of its wedges. Okay, I didn't say you how to define wedge, but it's similar. Like it's in the smooth case, they define non-zero classes in this homology. So, and since we know that spheres have like trivial even dimensional homologies, then they cannot admit the Lipschitz symplectic structure. But okay, so I didn't say you what is the Lipschitz symplectic structure. It just uh, it's just given by form. Which in every chart looks like standard form. So, what is Lipschitz symplectic form? It's just a form which in every chart looks like standard, standard symplectic structure. In R one. Up to diffeomorphism, or precisely. What do you mean up to the diffeomorphism? So, I mean, uh, I mean uh, in uh, in your atlas, uh, you uh, you have a lot of maps, and I mean, some of them could change omega zero, or do they? Uh, do you have like a sub atlas which is symplectic? So you ask, so you say it's a Lipschitz manifold which admit uh, symplectic form. Symplectic form is uh, is this what they said? And then you also ask for this, uh, for this, uh, for this thing, so that when you go from chart to chart, you you get again the standard form in every chart, which overlap. So somehow the the symplectic atlas is really small. Yeah. So, so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Okay. So that would be it. Actually, I'm in time. So are there any questions?